everybody. Thanks for tuning in again. Um, recently, I asked for video suggestions from uh, my Facebook friends and YouTube followers, and uh, I got a great suggestion from my longtime friend Mike. Um, he suggested that I do a video uh, explaining what the instruments are in the plane and what they do. So. Let's head on out to 1 2 Golf and we'll climb in the plane and I'll point them out and explain what they do to you. Thanks for coming along. All right, here we are in uh, 5 7 Juliet's hangar. I'm going to climb in. I'm going to give you an idea of what the instruments and controls all do. Okay. All right. I'll pull this back out of the way. We'll start over here on the left side. This is a primer. Uh, you pull it out and pump fuel into the cylinders prior to starting to get it to start. This is the starter button. This is your master switch. It turns off all turns on and off all the electronics, the radios, the intercom, the transponder, the light, etc. Uh, fuel pump. Uh, this plane is required to have the fuel pump on uh, when taking off, climbing out, and when you're landing. In cruise, you don't need it on. The engine has got an engine-driven fuel pump. And this is an electric fuel pump that's just uh, redundant, just in case something would happen to break with the engine driven pump. Here, the switch is for your nav lights. There is a green light on the right wing tip, a red light on the left wing tip, and that's uh, an aid at night so other airplanes can see, uh, see you and they can tell which direction you're going by which side the red light's on and which side the green light's on. Here's a landing light. Uh, it's like a headlight on the front of the plane. Uh, makes you very visible when you're in the air. Plus, when you get on the ground, if you should happen to land in the dark, uh, you can see where you're going. This is the beacon. Um, it is a red light on the top of the tail that blinks on and off. Uh, that's supposed to be on at all times uh, when the plane is running or about to start. You turn the beacon on prior to hitting the start button. This is where the keys go for uh, powering on the magnetos. The engine runs off magnetos, which is similar to a lawnmower. You don't need electrical power. Uh, you need electrical power to get the starter to go, but the engine does not need electrical power to continue to run. The magnetos create the spark. So right now the mags are off. That is the right mag. That's the left mag, and that's both. And you may ask yourself why there's a right and left uh, position on this key. Well, obviously, when you're running, uh, when you're in, when you're ever you're flying the plane, you want to have it in both. Um, the engine has got four cylinders, and each cylinder has got two spark plugs in it, and they each set of plugs runs off a different magneto. So I've got two magnetos on this plane. One is on the right side of the engine, the other is on the left side of the engine. So if prior to, uh, to taking off, you do a run up and you test and make sure both of those mags are working. Um, it's another redundant system uh, to ensure the engine stays running uh, and doesn't just fail for some reason. So uh, when you do your run up, you set it on both and you turn it to left, which should uh, show about a 75 RPM drop on your tachometer. Then you turn it back to both, it should go up. Then you turn it over to right, and you should have a 75 RPM drop there. And you put it back to both, and it'll go back up where you originally started. And that's how you ensure that your magnetos are working properly. I always keep the uh, switch in the off position and the keys go up on the panel so if somebody on the outside of the plane can see that the keys are visible and not in uh, the switch. 
This is carb heat. It uh, there's some there's some cowling underneath the engine that that uh, forces uh, when you pull this out, it'll force hot air uh, into the carburetor, which would help uh, eliminate any icing. So some carburetors have a tendency to build up uh, ice uh, due to uh, humid air going through a venturi and it cools down to the point where it may ice up your carburetor and if you get too much ice in there it restricts the flow of air and if it ices over completely your uh, engine will, won't be getting any air or oxygen to it so um, if you suspect carb ice you pull the carb heat and that will melt the ice that's building up in the carb and the water will just go into the cylinders and it, it, it's you know it gets burned out and comes right out the uh, the exhaust pipe that's your carb heat this is your throttle all the way out is idle all the way in i'm not going to push it in but all the way in is uh full power this is the mixture so uh these airplanes unlike cars they you've got to adjust the mixture manually um the higher uh, you go the higher altitude you fly it the thinner the air is so if there's less air going in there and You've got it running full rich. There's going to be too much fuel going into the cylinders So you need to pull it back and lean it out to get the air fuel mixture, right? And you have to do that manually this I mean this is 1950s technology but uh, there's many airplanes out there that, that work this way and that's this is how you actually shut the plane off you don't turn the key off when you're done flying you pull uh the mixture to full lean and it'll idle for two or three more seconds and it'll just quit once it burns the last of the fuel out of the cylinders okay over here this is heat so in the winter time yep my plane has heat in it once the engine warms up just like your car it'll blow out warm air um it won't blow out any warm air until the engine comes up to temperature. So that's for heat. We've got defrost and cabin heat. This is just a vent. Down here, over there, you can see a vent that goes outside. That opens and closes that vent. That vent comes in very handy in the summer. All right, let's see. Right here, we've got, can you see it? There we go, that's my compass. It uh, reads direct due east. So every airplane is required to have a compass. This is an airspeed indicator. Similar to a speedometer in the car. However, the uh, airspeed indicator is run off of air pressure. I've got what's called a pitot tube. That's P-I-T-O-T -T tube uh, on the bottom side of my left wing. And as you fly through the air, air is forced into that tube and the pressure the faster you go the higher the pressure is so the pressure of the air going into the pitot tube will move the needle up and around and it'll point directly at uh, your airspeed so this isn't ground speed this is airspeed it's the speed you're moving through the air <clears throat> okay here this is an altimeter and it tells you what your altitude is above mean sea level so here we're sitting on the ground here at uh, Shelby Community Airport 12 Golf and the altimeter reads 1120 feet which is the field elevation here right over here I don't know if you can see it or not there's some numbers and they look very similar to the numbers you would see on a barometer this thing operates very much like a barometer um, if you can imagine uh, low pressure air masses and high pressure air masses, if you look at a weather uh, map of the United States, you'll see high and low pressure uh, scattered around. Now, every airport uh, that's got a weather station will be able to report what the, uh, what the barometer reading is. If you listen to the ATIS, uh, on the radio it will tell you altimeter setting 3031 so there's 30.3 and you would just tune this to where the one is let's say 
and if you notice when I tune when I turn the barometer reading right there you can see the needle moving for the altitude so if you're flying from a low pressure air mass into a high pressure air mass the altitude uh, at your destination airport is going to be off when you're approaching your destination airport you've got to uh, listen to the ATIS the weather if they have it available and set your altimeter to the barometer reading that they uh, broadcast that's how uh, you know uh, what elevation uh, mean above mean sea level you are now most airports will also you can look it up and find out what their uh, uh, the airport elevation is so uh, keep in mind that when you're on the I mean if you're on the ground on the coast in Florida it's gonna read zero or 20 feet because you're going to be at sea level if you're in Denver this is going to read over 5,000 feet which means the little hand there is going to be clear down here so uh, this is a very important instrument let's see this kind of looks like a compass doesn't it but it's a directional gyro uh, it runs uh, off of a gyroscope and when you are flying, you're supposed to set this to the same heading as your magnetic compass. And when you're, if you happen to get vectors from uh, air traffic control on which way to turn, you will look here. As you turn, this, this thing moves as you turn. And if they tell you to fly 120, you would turn until... It says one, two right there. So, and these things, since it's got a uh, gyroscope in it, uh, they precess, which means that you set it now, but over the next course of the next 15 minutes or so, it may uh, go off uh, one way or the other slightly. So every 15 minutes when you're flying, you should uh, reset your directional gyro or DG, what we call it, with your compass. This is an attitude indicator. And right now it's all crooked because the plane's not running. This runs off of a uh, vacuum as well. It's got a gyroscope in it. And uh, when you start your plane up, it'll wobble like crazy for a minute and then it'll level out. And uh, that line that's the white line going down that way will actually line up with the horizon. So if you are turning, you can see these marks here. It'll tell you how many degree of bank you have. So if you want to do uh, a turn, if you're with an instructor and he tells you to make a 30 degree uh, banked turn to the left, then you can turn and until the thing reads 30 degrees which I believe is that uh, that mark right there okay let's move on now these are just a bunch of fuses um, everything in here that's electric will have a fuse and if you need to replace the fuse you just it's a glass fuse you just turn that pull the burnt fuse out put a new fuse in of the same amperage it tells you what amperage it's supposed to be Okay, this top thing right here, this is my intercom. So I've got two radios. Um, the radios are, okay, I've got COM1 and COM2. You can see there's COM1 and COM2. So right now the switches are down. That means that I can listen to both radios through uh, my my headset right there and my passenger's headset. We can hear what's going on the radio. Um, it's got on off volume and you know. Right now it's set on COM2, which is my bottom radio. So that's the radio I actually use. I can, I can talk on one and listen on the other. I've got COM2 as well. It's got an auxiliary mic, external, and uh, PA public address. This top radio here is called a NAVCOM. So this side of the radio you can tune in 
uh, communication frequencies that you talk on. This side of the radio here will tune uh, navigational frequencies, which will run an instrument like this one. This is uh, a VOR, which stands for uh, VHF Omni Range. And it's a uh, rather old uh, navigation aid. It's radio driven. And you can basically navigate from one VOR to the next VOR. That's the way you used to uh, travel across the country in a basically a zigzag motion. You'd have to go from VOR to VOR instead of going from straight from your uh, origin to destination. But it's the way you can navigate um, IFR also. You don't even have to be able to see the ground if you're instrument rated. I'm not instrument rated so I don't use it for that but it comes in handy as a situational aid for myself. I can tune a VOR and track it and just make sure I'm on the course I want to be on. So this bottom radio here is called a GPS comm. So the comm is the radio that I can talk on to air traffic control and it also has a GPS in it. And a little moving map will pop up here. This is pretty old technology too. Uh, well it's new relative to everything else in the plane. The plane's old but this is still 20 years old. Um, this, you, if I leave 1-2 Golf, right where I'm at right now, and I want to go to another airport, oh, uh, let's say, uh, Carroll County, Ohio, which is KTSO, I could hit the direct to button, dial in KTSO, and it will draw a line from here to, uh, Carroll County on the screen and it's also tied to this instrument here. Now this helps me stay on course. Um, this, it's got a circle in the center there as you can see and it's got a vertical line. Now if you are on course the vertical line is going to be right through the center of that circle. If you can imagine uh, the circle as being the airplane we're in and the line being the course. So if this line should happen to move to the left, that's gonna tell me that the plane is right of course. So you wanna to try to turn left to come back to bring this line back in the center. It's, a, it's just another navigation aid. Um, helps you get from point A to point B and stay on course and not wander and get lost. <clears throat> All right, here my engine tachometer. And it's hard to see but this plane since new has got 3,695.80 hours on it. So 54 years, 3,600 hours. Um, the tachometer will tell you what engine RPM you run and when you climb out uh, you want full power because you want to be able to climb uh, at a good rate. So that's throttle wide open. This will go almost up to 2700 RPM, 2650 or so. Uh, but once I get up to altitude and I want to uh, set the engine at cruise power so I stop burning so much fuel, I will pull the RPM back to about between 2350 and 2400. So that's what I cruise at. It'll do depending on how warm or cold the air is. Uh, you know, 115, 120, that's miles an hour. Um, let's go back here real quick. Airspeed indicator, the inside line here of numbers is knots, and the outside is miles an hour. So, uh, this plane, most airplanes, newer ones especially, they only talk in knots, but mine, uh, most of the speeds that my uh, handbook tells me I need to fly for different maneuvers is in miles an hour, so um, depends on how old your plane is. All right, this is a transponder. Um, when I'm just flying VFR, not talking to air traffic control, not have flight following or on an instrument flight plan, that should say 1200, which is the squawk code for VFR aircraft. 
and honestly 99% of the time I'm probably on uh, 1200 which is the FR. If you ask for flight following um, the uh, approach control that you're calling uh, to request flight following from will assign you a squawk code and you can use these numbers and punch it in there and when you punch it in they should be able to find you on their screen um, it'll show the number it'll show where you're at and they can uh, keep you advised of any traffic that uh, might become a factor in your flight um, and when they're done with you, if you're getting ready to land, they'll tell you uh, radar service is terminated, squawk VFR, you just push this button, and it automatically goes back to 1200. And your uh, radar services with air traffic control uh, are finished, and you're on your own. But you usually, usually do the flight following uh, almost all the way to your destination until you can see the airport you're landing at. Uh, then you're going to want to come off of the... Uh, uh, approach frequency and go and either talk to the tower if it's a towered airport or the common traffic advisory frequency which is uh, which was would would be what they use at uh, non-controlled airports so let's see this is an exhaust gas temperature gauge and it says in op on it because it does not work at the moment and it's not required it was uh, in here when I bought the plane um, I had a probe uh, I paid to have a probe inserted into the exhaust uh, manifold on the engine and that's where it gets uh, the temperature readings from now the the purpose of this gauge is uh, to help you um, adjust your mixture so if you have if you're dumping too much fuel if you're flying too rich with the uh, with the mixture here uh, it's going to be colder the low it's going to have a lower exhaust gas temperature uh, than if you had less fuel and if you're running too lean the temperature will rise so it just it helps you set your mixture so let's see all right, let's go to the controls right now. This is called a yoke. This this thing here is where I might put my iPad. I've got uh, ForeFlight on there. It's another uh, GPS uh, system. It's uh, an aviation software that helps me. It, it's just full of information. It's got charts on it, uh, radio frequencies, just about anything I need to know. But anyways, we'll move on. This is a yoke. It looks just like this one, except it's covered up with uh, my uh, iPad mount. This button here. Uh, when I want to talk on the radio, if I'm if I'm talking to my passenger sitting next to me, we just talk freely into the microphone on our headsets, and we can talk back and forth. But if you want to talk on the radio, uh, you push this button like that, and you talk. You will either talk to uh, air traffic control, or you will self-announce yourself and your location and your air craft uh, identifier and type uh, when you are uh, on the common traffic advisory frequency. So that's what that button's for. Now this yoke moves in and out, okay? If you push it all the way in, you're pushing the nose down. And if you pull it all the way back, the nose will come up. So that's I mean, when you go into land, you don't push it all the way forward because that just would make you go straight down very fast. It's This controls your climb and your descent, but it's uh, there's a lot more to it than just going down to land and pulling back to take off. So, turning, this operates your ailerons. So, if you look out there, you can see the aileron moving. So, when I turn the yoke to the left, the aileron will go up. Now, as the air goes over the aileron, it pushes that side, that wing down, which would cause you to make a left-hand turn. Okay? And if I want to turn right, I turn the, the aileron to the right, that pushes that aileron down, which lifts that wing and drops the other wing. The, the ailerons work uh, opposite of each other. The aileron on the left 
when it's down the other side will be up and vice versa the rudder pedals are down here you push the rudder pedals if you push the uh, left rudder pedal it it makes the plane yaw to the left and you push the right rudder pedal it will yaw to the right and that's very important uh, to, in keeping your uh, plane coordinated when you fly when you fly so when you it's used in conjunction with the yoke so if you turn left you're going to probably need to put in a little bit of left rudder as well and there's identical controls over on the other side these top part, top parts here are brakes then they're independent of each other I can apply left brake uh, it aids in turning if you need to make a tight turn on the runway after you land and you need to come back you taxi back you would push that brake and it would help you turn sharper all right here we go this this is your flaps now you know you use always use flaps when you're landing and sometimes you might use them taken off there's three positions oh there's four this is all the way down zero flaps there is 10 degrees of flaps that's 25 degrees of flaps and that's 40 degrees of flaps and if you look out here the flaps look right next to the aileron on the inboard side of the aileron that helps you slow the plane uh, when you're landing I mean, if you cruise at 120 but you want to land and come over the numbers on the end of the runway at 75 you got to get slowed down and in order to be able to uh, fly that slow and still have be able, uh, in control without dropping like a rock you need to have some flaps in it help you fly slower and still control the aircraft so uh, that's pretty much it this is the controls and the instruments inside this individual 1967 Piper Cherokee 140. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, uh, questions, if I said something wrong, I've been known to do that before. If any of you guys uh, think I explained something incorrectly, by all means, please uh, let me know and let everybody else know. But this is it. Thanks for coming along. See you next time.